announcements with you. The first thing I'm going to start with is that we we've had a pretty consistent number of about eight people that have been spending the night here, yeah. and uh, I think there's been at least ten or eleven different people, but it's almost been eight every night, and I'm I'm really grateful for that. Uh, the nights have been really very calm and peaceful, and we've had a lot of our people that have been engaged in terms of spending the night, and, um, you know, just volunteering for different things, cooking food. So it's it's really been an answer to prayer. We've been able to meet some people that, um, and there's been a couple people that have gotten jobs just this week. So that's that's really been been good. Um, it's been really good. Yeah, I would like to say a sincere thank you to everyone I put out a, a help call last week at this time, and boy, they lined up, and you guys went overboard on it. So yeah. thank you. Kind of sorry about the we had some snafus and scheduling, but uh, in the sign up stuff, but, uh, maybe we can get those bugs worked out. Thank you so much for for your volunteer work. And don't forget, we get one more month next month. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so when you sign up online, if you've done that, uh, after you get your name in the slot, there's a you have to kind of scroll down and there's a submit button at the bottom of that website page. And if you don't hit that submit button, it won't get record, recorded. So we think that's part of what happened. Uh, Militia's going to call everybody that signed up to volunteer that day. Unless you're on Saturday, you'll probably get a call on Friday. And uh, so you should get a reminder call. But if you're unsure of whether you tried to volunteer and whether it worked or not, all you have to do is get out of it and then get back on. And the next time you get back on, you should see your name in that slot. And if you have any problems with it, you can just call the office and we'll, we'll, we'll get Melissa. She, she knows how to do it. You know how to do it, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Expecting all us old people to know how to operate online and be able to do that may be on a reasonable expectation. Yeah. yeah. So just call the office if you want to do that. We have a very capable secretary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, That's right. right. Do it for you. That's right. <laughs> there you go, Melissa. What? You've been you've been um, complimented big time. I have. I appreciate that very much. It's called job security, right there. There is a list that we sent out today. We found a lot of the guys have um, have not had adequate clothing, so uh, there's some some items for men that if you want to to bring, you can pajama pants, hoodies, sweatpants, t-shirts, jackets, shoes. Um, so we're you know we'd like to to have more on hand for guys. And we'll, again, we'll have another. How you guys doing? Good. How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Is there a certain place you put the clothes that you ask me about? Yeah, you can put them in the gym. There's a table with clothes over there or in the clothes closet. <coughs> Either place we'd go hunt them down. Yeah. Um, you guys are aware that Steve and Margaret are traveling out of the country. They went to see Nathan, and there's a note. Uh, some communication from them that's in the email. That's good. Uh, the ladies' class won't meet tomorrow. I guess that's probably because Margaret's out of town. Uh, hey, next Wednesday, the, the Wednesday night dinners resume. That's a good thing. Chicken strips, mac and cheese, and green beans. So uh, if you could let Kathy or Melissa know, that's helpful, or you can... <coughs> Can you call? I guess sign up out so, there. Sign up at the connect table. All right. It's a good thing you're here. You know. I'm, um, yes, you'll get it. <coughs> and again, if you didn't get a chance to serve this week in winter shelter, there's another opportunity coming uh, at the very end of February. So that's a good thing. There's some other stuff going on for. Uh, for our sick and prayerless, Elna Lewis, who is the mother of Erica Taylor and the aunt of Bob Ford, been praying for her this week. And uh, Bobby Boswell, a former Bel Air member, passed away January 25th. And her funeral was Sunday, Sunday this past, I guess. This past Sunday. Monday. 
Okay, anything oh, else that we need to be aware of? Well, Miss Dorothy has COVID. I don't. Oh, really? Okay. Miss Dorothy's a very praying type person. <laughs> so she probably would not mind our prayers. She was there Sunday, wasn't she? Yep. <laughs> Jerry, I've got a couple things. One, Brian went on a new uh, medication today for his maintenance of the cancer. Uh, and uh, so appreciate prayers that this is going to be effective and also that the side effects will be less than they were under the previous uh, you know, approach. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, regarding Sheila Preston, uh, Sheila, uh, exceeded or didn't say she used up her days or Medicare days at NHC. Last Wednesday she went back home and so she's at home now with Kenneth and uh, you know she's not doing well at all. She's she has uh, you know they, they have not given them uh, a lot of hope with regard to her uh, you know, improving and recovering. Uh, and so uh, Kenneth is, you know, he's there with her, and he's just two of them, that's it. And uh, there's probably going to be an opportunity for folks to uh, participate in the food ministry and because uh, they need they need some help there, and we're going to get in touch with, is it Megan that's, that's on that? Curvy. 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 I talked to Celia. Okay, so she's going to be, you know, ratcheting that up. And uh, but Kenneth doesn't cook much, and she can't. I mean, she she can only walk about ten feet. That's that's it. So uh, they need attention and they need uh, some assistance there. Okay, for All right, good to see everybody tonight. Um, so let's uh. Take some time to take a deep breath. I know probably for some of you it's been a really busy and hectic day. So we'll take a few moments of silence and then we'll be praying on behalf of Brian and Sheila. All right. Let's just take a, a few quiet moments here. <clears throat> Father, we mentioned a lot of names here in your presence with your people, and we pray that you would come with your mercy, your grace, your healing, your strength, the kind of strength that you promise works in our inner beings, the same strength that raised Jesus from the dead. We pray for that in the lives of those that we love and that we're cared about, especially for Ryan, uh, for Dave and Celia, for Sheila, for Kim. Oh, blessings. Blessings on our time tonight. Please enable your spirit. Let us breathe it in to calm our minds, uh, to clear, uh, to be before you and to be with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to pass uh, this out if you can pass some of those down. There's here's next one. Colin was late, so Oh, let me have Do what? Anybody else need one of these? Oh, our share. I got it. Is there an electronic form of this? Uh, I can send you one, but I, I want you to, to do something with this. So there's some uh, pencils. If you don't have a pencil or a pen or a marker or whatever you want to grab out of there. How many people don't have one? I, you probably got extras. Rick Anybody else need a sheet? Sure. Okay. You made me a pen or a pencil? I've got one. 
Anybody need one of these? Okay. Okay, so I would like you to, you notice there's a couple of spaces for you to write in things at the end. But what I would like you to do is you go, as you look at this list, these are some of the, the challenges to, uh, to Christian faith that people have stated. And I want to know from you personally how you would identify the top five. And again, if yours isn't listed there, you have a space at the bottom, a couple spaces to write in something. Is this a top five of us personally, or the okay. top five in the world, top five the top in five America? Of you personally. Like I own top five. The, this, like, this would be, this is a challenge for me in terms of, um, in terms of my own Christianity, my own faith. Instance, number three, is Jesus' the only way? May not be a problem for me, but, but it would be a big problem worldwide. Yeah, and it, it is a problem for some Christians, but just for you, Don, I want to see yours. Uh, and if if you've got some that you know that aren't listed, you can you can write them in. So, do I have to rank them, or can I just check the top five? You can if yeah. <laughs> if you just want to check the top five, you can. If you want to rank them, it's more. What helpful. would make my top five? I, I have. It's easier for me to do that. Yeah. Okay. And please write something in because I don't want to assume that some of the things that really bother you are on there. And like if, if you just feel like just so confident and solid in all of these issues, you know, if, if just if some of them are minor irritant to you or something, you just some of these can be pretty hard though. And some of them may not challenge your belief in Jesus or God, but they really are perplexing. Are you writing them? So, <clears throat> so what are the challenges within your own life to questions of faith? What bothers you? What creates dissonance or confusion? What troubles you? What sometimes causes you to want to move away from faith? What are the biggest challenges to staying Christian? That's what I'm trying to poke at. Here's the second thing I would like you to do, and this is instead of a number you're going to circle. And I want you to put circles to the top three, if, if there are three. What kinds of roadblocks to Christian faith have you heard from people who are not followers of Jesus, who are not Christians, or who are not engaged in Christian community? I wouldn't follow Jesus because I wouldn't go to a church because or this really troubles me about Christian faith. Or I wouldn't believe in a God who... JP, do you need one of these? You don't, sure. you don't have one. I'm sorry. Although I know everything about uh, you after Sunday night. <laughs> yeah, you know everything you need. And about Kirby too, so... <clears throat> What kinds of roadblocks to Christian faith have you heard expressed from, from people who are not followers of Jesus, who claim no faith in God, or choose not to engage in faith community? I want you to circle three, the top three of those. Just three? Just what? Yeah, just three. Top three of what? These would, these would be people who are not followers of Jesus or who don't 
are part of a Christian community and they said this is why. Oh, yeah, that, that you have personally heard. That would be easier. Than Not that you guessed, but like you have actually heard somebody say this is why. And when you get done with those, if you'll just uh, pass them all to the center. What? Right. Nobody can read them. No eyes. name. I'm just going to keep mine, Jerry. I, I really need this. No, I'll give you another book. Here, you can have a blank one right here, Linda. But I need the one you wrote on. No, I'm not going to call it. written on hers. Oh, there's nothing written on hers. Okay, you can keep yours. You can hand it in later. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is trying to, and, and I'm, like, again, write things in, but I want the time that we spend together to be really relevant to where you are, I don't want to assume that what I've got on the list is true for everybody. And uh, some of these things are on this list because I see them discussed in venues pretty commonly. Some of them are here because of what I learned from working with college students the last 10 years. Some of them are here because of working with youth group. And, uh, but that's not the same as how you all work. So we really want this time together to be to be good for all of us, okay? What you do, what you try? So hand them in if you would. Yeah, if you want a blank copy, there's more up here, you can grab one. Actually, most of this was on the back of the bulletin the last couple of weeks. I think it was in the email that went out today. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is tally all these. And then we'll, we'll do some fun things next week. We'll kind of try to sort through these generationally, too. I'm really interested in that. Colin, we had a, um, one of the girls we worked at, at UGA, she was in Nashville uh, this past week. So Linda and I drove up to Nashville and we took her and her roommate out for dinner. And her roommate works for this company that sells uh, surgical equipment. Oh. You know, like all the kind of wires and yeah. stuff like that. And uh, anyway, she knew you. Never heard of your dad. <laughs> That's a random. Hopefully, she knew of good things. <laughs> yeah, she said good things about you. She, you can pass them inside out. Pass them, yeah. Just she heard of you. <laughs> she said, yes, I know Dr. Biggs. Okay. The lesser. <laughs> I can't wait to tell you that. Right. You didn't know about the patient that came up to him at the uh, NHC and said, thank you, thank you, Dr. Bills, for replacing my hip. <laughs> he said, you're very welcome. <laughs> it's about time. All right. So... What I'm going to do is take the input that you've given, and we're going to organize the class around that. And uh, I don't know that every week we're going to be on a different topic, and I'm not going to pretend to be like the one that's going to reveal the answers, but we're going to be digging in Scripture. We're going to be considering these things. But one of the most important things is for uh, the ability to be able to put out here honestly and candidly the struggles that we have or the struggles that people that we work with have. Maybe there are even struggles when we've got teenagers at home that, that our kids have. And so that's, that's really important to me. And I want to set the table for that tonight. And, uh, and then I've got, if we have time, I was just going to tackle the an easy one that would be kind of like a little mini lecture because it's like a softball. Like, it's so easy to me. And, um, and it was a surprise to me because I was doing a class like this in Athens. And a lot of the young families, one of the biggest hurdles to their faith was, can we really know that the Bible that we have 
has any resemblance to the Bible that was floating around? Like, is what's espoused in the Bible and the Gospels about Jesus, is it really, does it doesn't have anything to do with who Jesus really was, right? And it shocked me. I mean, I, I was surprised, but there had been so much. So we may, we may get to that, we may not. But after, we'll, we'll kind of organize this way. But So a uh, quiz for you. Uh, the top five fears right now among American adults. The Christian adults just... Just, just plain American just adults. They just, just released Hebb State University, yeah. just did a survey. Okay. Who wants to throw one out? Want to guess? Top five fears. Identity theft. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's, that's a good one. That didn't make the top five. <laughs> but that's a good one. Loneliness. Being alone. That's not loneliness. No, but that's certainly a, a huge, like an epidemic symptom. But like, what, what would you fear happening? So loneliness is something that people are experiencing. But Without Stock war. market crash. <laughs> okay, so number two is economic viability. It has to do with a collapse of the economy, or I'm not going to have enough money in the future. <clears throat> okay, so that was number two. Did war make it? War made war and terror made number three. <coughs> uh, nuclear war with Russia. So that was number three. Anybody else? Health issues. My health. Been getting sick. The, the interesting I, thing about that one is that that was on the list. That was number four, but it was harm to loved ones or illness mm -hmm. from loved ones rather than my own. Mm -hmm. Civil disorder? Uh, number one, number one is civil disorder and government corruption. Kind of just the whole functioning of our government and our civil society. Rick, did you cheat? Number one. <laughs> now, he's scared of that too. And uh, the last one was kind of an outlier. Spiders? No, it, it was uh, <laughs> polluted water. What? Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, isn't that something? What is it? <laughs> water pollution. <laughs> not having, Someone not having a good source of water to drink. <laughs> so, I say that before I uh, get into Psalm 34. And Psalm 34 says, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And teaching people to fear the Lord sounds like a mental health disaster right now because people are so afraid. Um, and, you know, we have theological concerns about, you know, the, the old uh, sinners in the hand of an angry God, you know, dangling us over the, the cauldron full of molten lava fire. And... Um, but I quote that because we, we know that the fear of the Lord, that, that Hebrew word, has a huge range of meanings. And that what, what the psalmist is getting at, who is having a very close dialogue and conversation with God, is uh, this idea of reverence and awe. And some of what we're doing on Sunday is we're... We're contrasting the ways that we have postured ourselves towards God with the idea of being with God. And I, I think you can hold those things in common if you understand we walk with one intimately. But we have this honest of this one, this he is so other than us. And his otherness, he doesn't want to create distance. But it creates an, an honest and a wonder with this one that we walk with. So, um, John, the follower of Jesus, would say there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not yet mature in love. So that goes back that he's, he's not talking about living with God in a feared relationship, but living, walking with this God with a great sense of awe. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of I'm going to say three or four things just to set the table for us. So there's a new book on awe. It's a bestseller. It's called uh, "Awe: The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life." How it can transform your life is a subtitle is almost on every book these days. Uh, 
but it's it's a real hot topic in positive psychology the health benefits of living with wonder and awe uh, Dasher Keltner who wrote the book is not a follower of Jesus but writes the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world that's the de definition of awe in the book awe creates what psychologists describe as the small self it's a self that comes to see itself as part of a greater connected whole it's a self that's in relationship with the world and a small self is more likely to engage in caring and compassionate action so the fear of the Lord that we live with an awesome and wonderful God who is wholly other than us so that leads me to my second point and I'm going to bring these all together that God is an eccentric God. And what I mean by that is He's totally outside. He comes from the outside. And we don't own or possess Him. This is really important for the class and for talking about God and talking about our hurdles with God. Um, that God exists beyond the boundaries of our community. The Cedar Lane Church doesn't own God. The Church of Christ doesn't own God. Nobody owns God. God is a free being to do what He will do and to be who He will be. And oftentimes, God is at such liberty that He stands with the very people that are our enemies and that we can tend to belittle and judge and oppress. And God says, well, I'll stand over there then with them. And that's mostly what the Hebrew prophets are doing, right? They're telling Israel, you thought I was with you, but I'm really with them. And that's a prophetic utterance. You know, that's, that's what's going on. Um, when the capacity to remember that about God is lost, God becomes captured by the group. <clears throat> And then God is used to baptize and justify our hostility and offense towards others. The other thing about God being so eccentric is free is that, and he's so big and powerful, and I just want to take this burden off of all of our shoulders tonight and in the subsequent night is uh, he doesn't need a defense attorney. And it's not your job to defend God. And I want you to feel free from that. And so if somebody is to say something that is offensive about God, um, that's your offense. And he can, he can handle himself. And that's important for us to be able to share, to know that we stand in a community of a God who comes close to us and a God who is actually eager to dialogue with us, even if our dialogue towards Him is in anger. Uh, because we're dialoguing with Him. You know, we're, we're confronting Him. And this is, again, what the prophets and what the psalmists are doing. So that's, that's important. And that leads me to eccentric life. That when we take our life as something that comes from out of us, outside of us, it's a gift, it's a life of gratitude. Um, we don't have to anxiously cling in onto our life, we don't have to anxiously cling onto all the things that uh, are important to us because everything that's really vital to us is protected by God. And so I want to give us permission to be free to lose because we don't secure ourselves. And um, and so that that leads me into necessary practices for the class. And one of the things I think that would be important for us is is to be able to really have a dialogue about you know where, what we really feel about these things and what we've come to understand about some of these hard issues. So here's, here's a biblical definition of humility. I, I got this just from a, a 
perusing some of the verses. Uh, humility is a suite of intrapersonal and interpersonal characteristics. So humility has how to do how I relate to my own ego and what I think about myself. And humility has everything to do with how I relate to you. And um, it involves the following. Possessing an accurate assessment of yourself. That's Romans 12.3. A willingness to acknowledge your mistakes and your limitations. That's James 5.16. I don't know everything there is to know about God. And I could be wrong about a lot of things that I do think I know. An openness to the viewpoint and ideas of others. That's Romans 15.1-6. An ability to keep your own accomplishments in perspective. 1 Corinthians 3.6-9. A low self-focus. Somebody once told me, like, Philippians 2 is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself a whole lot more, a whole lot less, right? Less often. And then appreciating the value of other people. The size and configuration of your ego affects how you see and treat others. Humility places us in an open and generous posture towards others, especially those who are different. Now, this is, this is a battle for me. Every day, humility. And then the final skill is, is listening. So when, when we're talking about difficult things together as a family, being able to open my mind and open my body, um, maybe even uncross my legs, open my palms as people are speaking. Uh, when things are hard and make me uncomfortable, trying to make that shift to where I'm okay. Let's let's be curious about what they're saying, and about why they're saying that, and about how they feel. And then maybe even after they're done, let's ask some questions to make sure I have heard really well about what they've shared, and not being judgmental or defensive. And then myself being vulnerable, like I respond with candid and true feelings that I'm experiencing, rather than. Rather than necessarily, you know, attacking them right away. So David Brooks, he's written this new book, How to Know a Person. He says, he talks about this posture of presence and respect and reverence. This identification with uh, the life of God inside other people. Being characterized by tenderness, inner dignity, receptiveness, openness, curiosity, affection, generosity of spirit and a holistic view of people where one sees the face of God in others and endeavors to see them in Jesus' eyes. I like that. So we're going we're gonna to try to practice those things because, man, what a tough year it's going to be. It's an election year. I'm just dreading it. I remember how hard it was four years ago for my church family. And it wasn't what we said when we were together. It was everybody reading everybody's Facebook posts and just all these kind of assumptions like, oh man, that was just terrible. I don't want to go through that again. So we're, we're going to do some stuff on that. All right. So quickly, um, if you're willing to, these are all kind of anonymous. A lot of you didn't put your names on. That's great because I, I just want the data. But what, uh, how would, you, what were you thinking as you're filling this out? Anybody want to share the number one challenge for either themselves or for people you know? that don't want to be a part of Christianity? What's the hardest thing for you for faith? I, well, there's there's several on there, but one of the, the ones I was thinking about was people will say, um, how can a loving God um, not necessarily punish people but like with wars and things like that, if he's so loving, why does he allow all this kind of stuff to happen and all these diseases and stuff like that? Um, that that bothers me. And that's I have a hard time with people with that uh, people feeling that attitude toward God because I think if you're a parent, you're going to do things that. Your children aren't going to like, or aren't going to. You're going to have to punish them, or discipline them, or whatever. Um, and people don't see that part; they just see the part that 
well, he's supposed to be loving and all encompassing, and so okay. I have trouble with that. So, I Mark, uh, <clears throat> the one that something about good people, mm -hmm. you know, like we've spent ex extended periods of time in Japan, and there's some really good people up there that live really good lives that may or may not believe <coughs> because they actively choose not to believe, but because they weren't raised to believe like we were. And they don't know. And that's, it's just something that I struggle with. And what makes it worth, worse is that you've got some people out there you're working with or you yeah. experience and they're really good, ethical, caring people. And then you go to church on Wednesday night and you, you see one of your brothers and sisters on not a good day, right? Yeah, right. Like, What's going on? It is a struggle. Um, one of the other things that I struggle with a lot is the literal, uh, it, you know, it's the Bible literally true or whatever, the literal versus the symbolic. You know, if you don't grow up, quote, in the church, I said, my family was Pentecostal, so a lot of the stuff that I've been told since I've come away from that is, oh, well, that was just symbolic stuff. That, you know, how, how do you know? You're just you're just going by what people tell you. What if you're wrong? You know. So I struggle a lot with with the literal versus the symbolic. Which which parts to read in a literal way? Which parts and how do you want to do it? Yeah. You know, you only know what you've been taught by people, and if those people were wrong because they were taught wrong, you know. Yeah. Who else? I find the activity of God as subjective is tough to wrap my mind around, especially in my relationships with believers from other um, <coughs> evangelical groups. You know, the talk of what God is doing or what God has told them to do sure has always that? been a place that's, you know, bothered me mainly from you know where, where I've where I've grown up and how I've understood God to act and not act and just kind of wrapping my mind around the subjectiveness of someone saying God told me this or God wants me to do this has mm -hmm. always been a place of struggle in my own faith yeah. to believe or not believe what they're saying yeah. that, that, that little conversation is always going on in my mind too especially because we were not raised in a faith tradition where there was a lot of God language Testing the spirits was not necessary. Anything we were taught yeah. to do is so your antenna in goes class. up when you just hear it. But then you don't want to be a skeptic. Correct. You want to believe in the activity. In the, yeah. Anybody else? I want to second what she said about suffering, like suffering of children. Still friends? I mean, we're not close. We're kind of acquaintances. She used to buy a lot of stuff, kind of stuff for that little girl. So she used to use a lot of her toys and stuff. But I mean, we've never been like close, close. But I want to reach out to her, but I also don't know what to say. It's not such a tough situation. And there's, I know, I know there's a lot of people that have reached out to her because she's very vocal about it. And she just she makes another post about basically leave me alone. <laughs> I had a friend that had a three-year-old pass away from brain cancer. I'll tell you, um, being involved in the community through my wife teaching is, uh, you know, it's just, it's something. There's a lot of little kids that, you know, six-year-old kid, six-year-old kid walking to school on their own. 
because nobody in the house is up to get them ready and not having clothes and not having food. And if the teachers buy them clothes, they go home and they get returned to the store so they can use the money to go buy drugs. <coughs> And, and you know that we're all sitting in this room out of luck or getting our who knows what. Like it's by virtue of who we were born to, right? That's a great mystery. That's sort of what you're talking about. I mean, it's hard to make sense of it. with the, is Christianity homophobic? Mm -hmm. um, like, how do we handle that? And how, I think a lot of the younger generation, like I think about my niece who's 20, is really turned off from, because she feels like just people at church, Christians, are just shutting those people out and um, are extremely judgmental. And I know <coughs> some, like, um, I know of some churches that accept, um, I guess, the LGBTQ community to come worship with them because they're believers. It's, it's I struggle with that, um, and uh, and I know the younger generation really does too. So that's something that I would I would like to dig more into. That's the one thing that's been. Talk louder. Talk louder. Can you hear you? Please. <laughs> the one thing I've heard a lot um, when I've invited people to church is that they didn't want to go because Christians are either stuck up, judgmental, or hypocrites. And they said that every Christian they've ever been around like preaches and does their thing on Sunday but then doesn't live a life of Christianity outside the church. Or mm -hmm. they have treated them poorly because of something in their past. I think on this issue, and then the one of, of suffering and things, uh, that this is just one example of where we're really just going to have to be receptive of each other. Because you, you, you know, we need a place where we can be honest. And um, by the way, they they rated uh, when they rated the faith of kids that have remained faithful in churches and have grown up. Um, the number one factor was if they had other adults in their life that were listening to them. The second thing was, is did they have a place where they could honestly express the doubts and the fears they had about their faith? And I, I just think that's true for us too. And, you know, when we went uh, when we went through the a lot of the racial unrest that was going on in the country mm -hmm. with, with the, the George Floyd, um, you know, with with all of that uprest, we had a number of African American families and. Uh, that they really wanted to talk about some things, and there was a lot of defensiveness. You know, there were some of us that didn't want to go there because we didn't want to be accused, or we didn't want to, we didn't want to talk about it. And um, it wasn't that they wanted to accuse or blame anybody, but we were their church family, and this is a place they wanted to try to process what in the world was going on. But we were also jacked up with each other. You know, and so afraid. And uh, <coughs> we ended up doing it on the side through a Zoom. Um, but it was something that we, we couldn't do publicly as a church um, because people felt like we were kind of forcing people in that conversation. That probably wasn't the wise thing to do in the case. So we, we had to have a a sidebar with about 25 or 30 people that were willing to to dig into that. And uh, several of my African American brothers and sisters, we started those conversations and it wouldn't be uncommon for them just to weep. That's all they wanted to do is cry with us. So it, it's very important to be able to have a space where you're loved and accepted and you can even say things that are hard and, and even say things that are wrong. And, and 
and this will these will be some areas that will really try us. Yeah. Anything else? I'm not going <laughs> to solve all these problems. Tonight will be an outlier because this is a softball. This is the easiest one. <coughs> but um, we, we will dig into scripture. We'll listen to each other. We'll talk about some things together. and um, We'll do, do some praying too. Anybody else before we start on this? I would just offer that uh, we should acknowledge the Complexity with which we try to address some of these things. I think we come to we come to religious, even church gatherings, with the idea that we want a sim simple, direct, give me what I need to kind of know about it. And we have to acknowledge that there is a great deal of complexity when we begin to deal with some of the things that we've heard expressed tonight. And our willingness to Embrace that complexity, the tension that comes with that complexity. I think is very, very healthy for people, and we need to we need to get some space to that complexity. So we're yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So it'll have its own pace, and, um, and then some things we, you know, some sometimes we're just gonna maybe end with some mystery and prayer, um, and a recommitment to be united even though we may feel different ways in a recommitment to try to engage. So I, there's only 15 minutes left. Um, I don't even know if I want to want to get into this. Um, well, we might try it. All right, anybody else? We, we do this. I, I want to I talk a little bit about um, just because I, it's an area where, where I did a lot of study about the idea if the Bible is uh, is corrupted. Hmm. It's kind of what you had shared, but this was uh, something that I, I worked with a lot in Athens, and I was really surprised at how many young parents. I was talking about this with Andrew today. Is uh, <coughs> I think these things come up again because we grow up, like they, we grow up and, and we kind of answered and settled these matters of faith. And then we look at the next generation coming up and we think they have other challenges, but we don't go back and lay the foundation that we got. We just assume that they've got that foundation too. And then lo and behold, a couple generations later, the doubts are there again, or that's because we haven't done a good job of, of allowing for those conversations or opening room for them. So, um, this, this is one that's kind of reared its head. Um, many of you are aware that in the 20s there was this, these scholars that all got together that was in this, this idea of biblical criticism and they were uh, taking these, these uh, source criticism approaches to the Bible and it's what they called the Jesus Seminar. And they were dissecting the Bible and you know trying to figure out what, you know, you got the Gospel of Matthew but Matthew got you know, this source and another source, you know, how did he put his story together? And what sources was he using? And then they got to think, well, what's really true? Like, what, you, you take the gospel of Matthew, and like, what did Jesus really do? And what is Matthew just making up? And did Matthew even write it? Maybe there's other people that are making up stuff. And so they had the Jesus seminar. And this thing came back with a vengeance uh, I guess about 10 or 15 years ago. And it's this challenge of what we have in our hand right here. What this is, does this bear any semblance uh, to what Apollos was reading? You know, <clears throat> or what the, what the Christians, is this thing reliable at all? How many of y'all seen the Da Vinci Code? Yeah, okay, so thank you. That was, that was a while ago. So, uh, you know, you have a guy that's questioning why are some books in the Bible, what was a conspiracy that threw out the other books? Did all this stuff get made up and it's a, after Constantine came to power? 
So this, this is kind of what this is all about. These, uh, the latest one was five the five Gospels. What did Jesus really say? Right? The authentic sayings of Jesus. And again, then you had this novel um, by Dan Brown that, that created a lot of uh, a lot of upheaval, upheaval on the heels of this, where um, he's really questioning the Gospels and why were not other Gospels included? It was just all random and what political and theological motivations? And out of this, um, this guy writes, uh, Bart Ehrman writes uh, this New York <coughs> Times bestseller. And he is going on the talk shows. Uh, he's on TV. He's doing interviews. Um, all the late night shows. He was on two of the major three being interviewed about uh, his book, Misquoting Jesus. It's kind of like uh, one, one time he used the idea of the telephone game. Have you ever played that? You know, where you got the, so you got one person has a message. And then the message at the very end, when it goes down the chain, is just like so distorted. And that's that's kind of how he's talking about scripture. Um, how can we be confident that what we hold is what the first believers had then? So all about this Jesus seminar. Now these guys, this last time they got together, it's a lot of biblical scholars, uh, four or five, and this guy's a student of a guy named Metzger, who's a huge scholar. And they went through the whole Gospels and every parable and every saying of Jesus and they had different color beads. And they had, they had jars and if you thought, hey, this is something that Jesus probably really said, you put a blue bead in a jar. And if you thought, well, we're not so sure about this, maybe you put a green. And then, no, this is just made up from later church tradition, you put a yellow. So if Jesus said something that sounds really like Confucius and wise, yeah, he said that. But if he said something like, I'm, I'm the son of God, no, that just made that up. That's legend, right? They came up with it. That's kind of how the thing went. Uh, that's how these guys did it. So they, they concluded that only 18% of the sayings of Jesus were authentic, is what they came to believe. And uh, so, New York Times bestseller, um, pretty pretty popular. Um, and and his ideal is, you know, we don't we don't have the originals. Obviously, we know we don't. We don't have the first copies of the originals. So we don't have Matthew's Gospel. We don't have the first copy of Matthew's Gospel. We don't have the copy of the first copy of Matthew's Gospel. Um, and he says in the book, the copies we have disagree with each other. And then in interviews he says, uh, and he says this in the book, there are more variants than there are actual words. There are more variances in the copies than there are actual words in the Bible. Now that sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. and the Washington Post wrote that uh, here was a scholar who peered so hard into the origins of Christianity that he lost his faith. So, you know, this, this less left a lot of people really in despair about their faith. I mean, it left a lot of people with heartburn. And then some people's reaction to it was, well, I'm not going to pay any attention. I'm just going to keep going on with my faith, just as it is. I don't even want to hear about it. You know, I'm going to cover my ears and sing real loud so I don't have to pay attention to it. So this is kind of what stirred this up. Okay, so you kind of had mentioned this. Anybody else? Does this resonate with anybody? So some of the discussions I've had um, with younger people is um, there, there's a lot more about feeling 
the emotional side than actually having a skill to do research and reading and historical context uh, and and uh, critical thinking as you approach scripture and, and with that having some kind of um, going into it with a, uh, a predetermined approach that this is God's word and seek to try to truly understand it. No, I'm, this is really about I observe how Christians act. I see that everybody is going this way. I see a lot of people hurt and these good people are ignoring these people that are hurt. I want to see more practice of faith and less understanding of biblical truth. Yeah, I've heard that a lot too. Yeah, I think I think that's this common. Um, but here's the thing, like that's true of us too. There's a lot of things that we believe about our faith and we believe about the Bible that are really hooked into our emotion and how we've experienced our faith. And uh, we also are reluctant to do some of the work of really digging in and thinking through and being open and investigating. But that's the first part of what you said. But yeah, the second part is they want to see us walk it instead of just talk it. All right. Well, hope hope we've whet your appetite. So I'm mm. going to give you a week to uh, to just be anxious about this. <laughs> <laughs> Go watch the Vinci Cave. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll take a we'll take a run at the beginning, and then I'm going to look at these sheets, and um, and we'll start sort of uh, we'll give you some feedback on these things, and then we'll do some generational things and see which ones affect us, and then we'll start plotting through them. Yeah. So anyway, I hope I got you set up to where you might want to come back. <laughs> Let's just say Bar Ar Arman, he, he just, uh, I've, he, he just uh, really enjoyed, I think, selling a lot of books and being on TV, but this goes back to, I think that's what a lot of people wanted to believe because of how they perceived the way that so many Christians were, were acting and they perceived the harm that uh, that they thought Christian faith was doing to the world. And, uh, so we'll, we'll we'll take a look at that. That's why this becomes a, an important jump off. That's a real real thing. Why did people <clears throat> want to believe this, even though that they had just dug a little bit? They could say that not only was Airman wrong, he was dishonest. But people wanted to believe it. I was trying to think, didn't he write a later book also? And this this is kind of interesting uh, that he defended that a person uh, by the name of Jesus actually existed later on, which was kind of interesting. So he, he has all of this thing about uh, raising doubts, but at the same time he wanted to defend the fact that Jesus actually existed. So let's pray a little bit together. Father, we we just see the challenges before us and it's it's so hard to sometimes for us in our faith, especially in this space that we're in in our country, uh, where where people are have a lot of heartburn about the failures of Christian faith, where churches are losing members, where many of our fellow countrymen are, are choosing not to participate in faith communities. And Father, we really desire to keep our hearts very soft. We don't want to be against the world, but we want to be for the world that you love. 
We want to acknowledge that you are wonderful and beautiful and that you are out there active, calling all kinds of people to you. We want to see the beauty that is there. We want to see the heartache and the suffering. We want our hearts to continue to be soft and broken by that. And Father, in this space that we're going to have together on Wednesday nights, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to help to heal and to comfort us with your presence and with your promises. And Father, for our faith to be deepened so that we can truly say that we live by an experience of you and by your very own being. And not just by what we believe about you, but because of who you are. I pray that we would grow to love you more and love others more. Father, I pray for a unity, a commitment to each other, a growth in our love for each other so that we hear each other very, very well. And, uh, and for the gift of your wisdom and your discernment. Help us not just to, to be about knowledge, but about truly forming us as people who understand and see and hear and uh, who, who change our ways where we need to change. But God, I thank you for the love in this room. I thank you for what you've done in our lives and how you brought us to you. And we're so grateful for that. We depend upon you feeding us our daily bread, uh, not just physical nourishment, but spiritual nourishment. We depend on your protection that you would keep us from the evil one. You'd not let us fall in temptation. We pray for renewed vision that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in all things for honest appraisal of ourselves so we desire your forgiveness and desire to, to give it to others. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your otherness. We are so glad we can't control you and we can't fully know you. But what we do know in Jesus Christ, we celebrate and we, we give thanks for. In his name, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. <coughs> Mm-hmm. <clears throat>